Francisco in a small office in Amsterdam as well. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job, of course, but we mentioned that we're hiring. Um, I'd like to chat more about that. Um, yeah. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, enjoy the talks, and I'm going to turn it over to Drake. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to this exciting meetup um, where we get to learn to leverage Kubernetes for AI and machine learning systems. My name is Tariq Hussain and I'm part of the StackPoint Cloud team. Um, and I'm filling up in for our usual host, Matt. StackPoint Cloud makes it really easy to spin up a Kubernetes cluster and you can follow this link actually to try it out. Um, first, I'd like to talk about our long-term meetup sponsor, Sysdig. Sysdig provides uh, great tools for mon monitoring and troubleshooting your container systems, and they have uh, great Kubernetes integrations. And visit sysdig.com. Oh, sorry. Um, visit sysdig.com to learn more about uh, the meetup sponsor. And secondly, I'd like to thank Chartboost um, and uh, for graciously hosting this event and providing the food and drinks. Um, check them out, chartboost.com. Before I talk about uh, our first speaker, I'd like to request everyone uh, to kindly wait until the talk is over for your questions. Um, we will have um, separate time for questions and answers. Um, so I really appreciate your cooperation on that. Now, our first speaker um, today is Chris Fregley. He's an authority uh, on AI machine learning systems and pipelines. He's a former Netflix um, and Databricks engineer, uh, O'Reilly author, and um, Chris will speak today on building Google's machine learning engine from scratch with GPUs, Kubernetes, Istio, and TensorFlow. Please welcome Chris Frigley. This microphone. Hello. Hello. Okay. It's so funny. It's like a lamp shade kind of thing, like a desktop. So the HDMI and like your laptop. Sure. Strings point. Maybe hit the packet. So, uh, yeah, lots to share. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chart Boost, for hosting this, um, and thanks to the SF Kubernetes. Folks, yeah, this is one of those times when um, you realize this is why we live in this uh, super expensive town with, uh, you know, homeless people everywhere and uh, drug needles and things like that. It's a beautiful town, San Francisco, but like this is a reason that we live here is to bring people from Google who work on Kubernetes and TensorFlow, uh, these um, right, like Stack Cloud people, Stack, Stack Point, Stack Point IO, Stack Point Cloud. Um, actually, I, yes, I had a chance to use StackPoint uh, today. I, I was setting up some clusters in a federation um, with Kubernetes, and actually I think I still have the screen up here. Um, it's super easy. I had to get Matt to open up my account again because there was a big paywall right when I got there. I hadn't used it in about a year. Uh, so they gave me access for a little bit. Um, it's a pretty cool project. You can actually create federations pretty quickly. And, um, I don't work for these guys, but uh, it's pretty slick. Um, <clears throat> so today's talks are going to be about machine learning with Kubernetes, uh, you know, sort of distributed clusters, um, both on the training side and on the serving side. And I'm going to take you guys through like a little story. This is you know like a different crowd than um, my other meetup, uh, which is the Advanced Spark TensorFlow meetup. So. Um, I think you guys uh, will really enjoy it. Let me 
do a screen share here and capture. Yeah, so we're gonna like do a screen share and then he's gonna become the host here when uh, he's up to speak. So um, the title mentions uh, the Google Cloud ML engine and um, I, uh, yeah, so just last week, yeah, was it last week was reInvent? Like two weeks ago reInvent? Uh, so there's this new service called Amazon SageMaker, which I'm super excited about actually. And uh, for full disclosure, um, I was super excited about Google Cloud ML when it first came out, and I'm still excited about it. Uh, this like new Amazon SageMaker service actually supports uh, like TensorFlow 1.4 and uh, or like supports TensorFlow better than Google Cloud ML Engine does right now. Okay. So yeah, obviously that's gonna change, but uh, for the Amazon reInvent, right, like the Amazon AI guys really stepped it up. Um, and I also used to work for Databricks and I would always get asked when I'd work the booth, why the hell would you ever pay for Databricks for the product that I was representing? And I would always be like, don't pay for it, just start up your own, it's hard servers. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, of course, it's two years later now, but uh, you can actually create a new notebook here and you know, give it a name, you can select an instance type. So this was about 25 engineers at Databricks was behind this book. Um, and just getting all this stuff set up and the you know, GPUs mounts, and they still don't have a good GPU um, like solution over there. So yeah, check this out. If you are gonna spin up um, or like a notebook and do uh, some like machine learning. Also, they have this this job section, which right, like again was about twenty people uh, at Databricks engineers working on jobs. And um, what's cool is that you can do create job. You can say you know this is MNIST or whatever. Uh, train MNIST. The cool thing here is that like you can select from uh, the Amazon kind of pre-baked uh, like models here, and, and which most people probably won't do. Um, now that you know that there's this this section here for custom, so you can actually select a custom Docker image. Um, you give it the coordinates to your right, like Docker image that you've uploaded into ECS or into uh, right, like ECR. And just as long as your Docker image actually has right, like a, a CMD or an entry point down at the bottom, uh, it will get invoked. And the cool thing is that there's tons of samples straight out of the box that show you how to do distributed TensorFlow, you know, which is one of the like, kind of mysteries of TensorFlow, right? Um, so they have like a whole ton of like notebooks and everything, uh, all the way to distributed TensorFlow using the like very latest estimator API. Uh, from TensorFlow, you know, one three and, and one four, um, you know, which is really the way that you should be doing distributed TensorFlow. So, um, yeah. Also, too, you can select, you know, your GPU here. This is the most expensive, uh, Volta V one hundred. Uh, you can do, you know, twenty four of these. Um, you can give it, you know, a terabyte. I'm not going to do this because this will cost a um, shit ton of money, but. You can also specify hyperparameters that you can gain access to within your training job. Um, so you can put ranges in here, you know, try out different values. Uh, yeah, this is um, super cool. This is right out of the box. Also, you can set up these training channel or these um, right, like data channels. And so you would have a channel, for example, for your training data set. Uh, you give it the S3 location, right? So this was five engineers at Databricks so supposed to get that, that box working right there uh, and still uh, still maintain it. Um, you could also set up right, like validation data set, uh, you know, compressed. Um, yeah, so MXNet uh, has this, this file format called record IO, um, which is not specific to MXNet, it's supported here, so you could actually store, uh, it's, it's kind of similar to the TensorFlow TF record, or if you're familiar with any, you know, um, right, like things like Parquet and, and right, like ORC and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So again, you, you can give it different channels that you can then reference within uh, your like estimator that you've got within TensorFlow. And of course, you can specify the output bucket. Um, if you're going to do multiple runs, you would you know start with the root of that bucket and then separate them out by the run ID. All right. So. Um, 
Yeah, also last week was KubeCon. Yeah, so maybe you could talk about KubeCon a little bit. Or you're basically going to, yeah, all the stuff that like Google announced and um, yeah, your group announced. Well, yeah, so that was pretty big. Yeah, did anyone go Got to that conference? An awesome group. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I ended up going down to MIPS uh, down in LA, down in Long Beach, and uh, I was being told all the sweet stuff happening um, in Austin. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a lot of pictures of the snow, uh, which is a harsh reminder why I moved here from Chicago. Um, all right, and then the other thing too, so you know, as some of you might know, Pipeline AI is a company I started about a year ago. We're focused on model serving. So it's kind of, uh, it's the pipeline after uh, most pipelines finish, right? So there's a lot of, um, you know, tooling, there's Databricks, there's Domino Data Labs, there's SIFT, you know, yeah, there's all these uh, tools out there to do training, but like most people kind of end their pipeline right there. They might spin up a Flask app and you know, run some, some crappy Python process that has no metrics around it, has no insight. Um, you know, there's services like, I think it's uh, like Azure ML where you can just kind of drag and drop and create a REST endpoint. And, you know, that's, that's still a bit wonky. Um, so what's cool about SageMaker is it's all of the things that, that Pipeline has been rather wanting to do and, but all the nasty infrastructure side of it, right? So, Pipeline's focused more on the experimentation and being able to, to train a model and push it out and extend your model uh, like validation step into production, right? So uh, like typically you would validate your model on like offline data, batch. Um, once that data is, is in, you know, like your S3 bucket, it's now out of date. And, and what you really want to do is be validating things, you know, in production as best you can with live data. Uh, so, you know, we'd spent the last few months, we actually caught wind of um, like SageMaker, I, I think the old name was Iron, was Iron Man or something like that, um, which is still in some of the, the links and, and you know, things like that when you're going through the SageMaker docs, you can still see the Iron Man reference. But, um, so, right, like behind the scenes, I actually don't know what SageMaker uses. I assume it's just ECS. Um, yeah, so Amazon announced EKS, uh, yeah, which is awesome. So the Elastic, Kubernetes service, I guess. Um, and that's super exciting. Uh, also, um, yeah, so recently Docker, I think it was Docker from Copenhagen, yeah, so they announced first class Kubernetes support. So there's always this Docker swarm thing that's just kind of a, like a map that you always kind of push aside and want, you know, to like do something real. Uh, and so Kubernetes um, is now uh, going to become part of Docker. Um, all right, so one cool thing about this SageMaker thing, since I'm in here, is that you can actually upload multiple variants of your model. And so one thing that we see a lot um, at Pipeline, right, so I'm showing a tool that, that we're you know, now supporting um, through Pipeline. And we actually can create the Docker images that, that work with SageMaker here. So, um, but like you can create a uh, like GPU version you can create um, a CPU version uh, that's using TensorFlow, a GPU version using TensorFlow, or a scikit-learn version, all of the same model. And you can push them out into production and then spray traffic and you know, see uh, like how they do it live. Um, so yeah, these are the different variants here. I'll actually, I can run a quick, quick load test because I have this running. Um, we have it built into the pipeline CLI here, where we can just call. Yeah. So we've deployed three different variants, and we want to, we're pointing at a common endpoint. Um, yeah, also with SageMaker, you could actually specify uh, a split. So, you know, 20% go to the first model, 10%, and then 70% uh, kind of thing. So, following point name is predict.
All right, so yeah, this is hitting a common, um, right, like SageMaker endpoint. This is like totally been provisioned by Amazon behind the scenes with just like a couple of clicks of a UI and pointing to a, a like, custom Docker image that is listening on a particular port um, and can accept a post. And you know, here we're just posting JSON. Um, we're posting a JSON version of an image and then getting back the prediction. This is MNIST. Um, so that's how you would do it with SageMaker. Um, I'm going to show you guys, since this is a Kubernetes talk. Uh, so I have a you know, cluster out here. I tore down the stack point ones because um, I was having a problem with uh, the federation stuff, not uh, like related to stack point. But, um, so yeah, this is just my own uh, right, like bare metal. Well, it's not bare metal, it's Amazon. But. So I've deployed two models out here, uh, right, like two different variants, and I'm gonna run something very similar, except now it's pointing to And then, so here we see the same thing. It's just, so there's two different variants. So um, what I was gonna try to get working was showing it, pointing at my Kubernetes cluster, pointing it at SageMaker, and um, you know, having Azure, having um, probably Amazon, and then a Google Cloud, but um, had a small problem with uh, the Federation stuff that, that uh, couldn't get fixed before this. Okay, so that's the demo part. Um, let me just run through some slides. Yeah, so who here has heard of Istio and Envoy? Should be the same people. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah Envoy is pretty badass. Yeah, anyone here from Lyft or from the, yeah, the Envoy project? Um, yeah, one thing, yes, I know that there's a couple of Uber people here. Um, Lyft is actually starting to soak up a lot of my, my friends. Um, and there's a guy, Jamie Greer, that used to work for the Flink folks, data artisans. He's now doing streaming over at Lyft. Um, yeah, this Envoy project. So I'm like super impressed with the, the work that those Lyft guys are doing. Um, and I think they have a San Francisco office, or they just moved, right? They used to be. Yeah, they used to be over by the Best Buy, and then they moved somewhere. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so I already mentioned SageMaker, the Google Cloud ML stuff, I'm just gonna make fun of it for the next month or two until they, they match uh, the SageMaker functionality. Um, Azure ML, I uh, lost my Hotmail password about four years ago, so I uh, haven't been able to log in to Azure. Um, still, I'm still looking for that. Uh, some exciting news, just you know, to kind of toot our own horn here. Um, we participated in this uh, this startup challenge through the O'Reilly folks back in September, and um, some of the the uh, demos and screenshots I'm going to show you guys, I think, were the things that actually helped contribute to that. So, um, you know, it, it was this like creepy happy hour thing that they just kind of opened the doors, and everyone from the AI conference. Um, all kind of rushed in and they had VCs kind of interspersed throughout. And it's pretty easy to spot a VC because they're wearing like a cardigan and like nice shoes and stuff. And yeah, right. It like looks like they just came from the Rosewood or something like down in Palo Alto. Um, so we spotted one or two of them and schmoozed them. And then um, there was like a robot on one side and there was like a drone on the other. And you know, there was like an Alexa thing that people had created. So like we thought we had no chance of actually winning this thing. Um, so we just got wasted, and that seemed to work. Uh, but yeah, we won. I have no idea how. Um, also, yeah, December, so a week after SageMaker was launched, um, all we had to do is make a few changes because our designs were so similar to our Docker images. And now our you know, super optimized Docker images for TensorFlow, Scikit, uh, our uh, Python, Java, all that stuff, they all work through SageMaker. Uh, yeah, former Netflix, former Databricks, uh, did a year at the IBM Spark Tech Center, built that thing up um, to about 65 people. Uh, I think they're going to go through a bit of a rebranding, just like if you notice the Spark, uh, the Spark Summit is now called the Spark and AI Summit. 
uh, it's kind of Databricks way to be like, hey, don't, yeah, don't forget about us over here. Um, that we're the new Hadoop. Uh, so yeah, like built that team up, which was fun. We hired Martin Odersky's son, who actually might be here. Yeah, Jacob, are you here? Uh, yeah, so, which is like a really tough position to be in when your dad created Scala and like we bring him on to be the Scala expert. And, you know, we're like hitting him up with all these like deep questions about Scala. You know, the poor kid was like 22 or something. Um, so yeah, if you guys would, um, yeah, go join this Spark Tensible meetup. We actually just had one last night. We're going to have another one in um, January. That's aligned with the Rework AI conference. That's a really good conference, by the way. Uh, you should check that out. We have all the videos and stuff out on YouTube and SlideShare. You can Google it. Um, all right, I'm just going to skip through some of this stuff. Oh yeah, so I like to make fun of VCs all the time, um, which is uh, not really helping the fundraising process, by the way, but um, I still do it. So I was speaking with a pretty well-known VC um, about uh, a month ago, and I just casually mentioned that we have 2,000 GitHub stars. And uh, based on what we we're asking for, you know, the amount of money, um, he said, well, you know, two, yeah, 2,000 stars, really the most that will give people is $3 million. And so this is the first time that I had heard someone actually admit to uh, uh, price per star, right, which was kind of interesting. So if you do the, you know, complex, like gradients and, you know, backdrop, you end up at 15,000 uh, per star, um, which is, you know, pretty interesting. And then, uh, while well, speaking with him also, I was like, well, what's the next step? Like what, so that's seed money and it's up to 3 million, that's fine. Um, he said the next step would be 6,000 stars. And that's kind of a, you know, a money. And like, I don't really know too many projects that have 6,000 stars. You know, who has 6,000 stars? Um, so, yeah, anyway, and then there's this, this cool little like geo thing here. Um, there's this website called Red Dwarf. Um, yeah, so Google Red Dwarf, like GitHub, I don't just do Red Dwarf, there's, there's a lot of stuff that comes back. Um, but you can put in any like GitHub repo and it'll actually plot it out and show you kind of where the hotspots are. So, uh, you know, yeah, given that I spent about $30,000 in Europe the last couple times I've been there, it's nice to see, uh, yeah, that area lighting up um, with, uh, okay, so, yeah, this is just more pipeline stuff. So why the heavy focus on model serving, right? Like we get asked this all the time, why not just become another Databricks or you know, do something like that? Um, besides the fact that there's already 8,000 people in that, um, you know, and Y Combinator continues to pop out people like this. Uh, like, yes, yeah, so we want to be on the other end of that, right? So there's this huge swell of people training and there's gotta be some, some you know, outlet to actually serve these things. And then also just the real time stuff, um, and then finally, you know, there's so many optimizations that are sitting on the table that people, that like data scientists don't have access to right now. And it's because these are systems level things. You know, these are optimizations, uh, not of the typical hyperparameter tuning that you're used to, like learning rates and tree depth and you know, things like that. These are like, um, you know, so there's the obvious one, CPU, GPU. And so this is one reason also that um, like TensorFlow is like super attractive to us because there's so many things you can do after that model has been trained to get that model to be much faster. You can fuse together layers. Um, there's like all these low level tools that like apparently not many people know about. And yeah, so the obvious one would be just give a data scientist the ability to run their model in a GPU, right? Like that, that's all they want to do. Um, and then compare it to the CPU. So have both running out there in a safe way. Um, so, and then like the other one uh, with TensorFlow specifically, there's, there's starting to become a lot of hardware support. Um, so there's, you know, uh, there's these Google TPUs, these tensor processing units, there's people that have spun off of the TPU team that are building separate um, chips that are optimized for like TensorFlow and for these um, rather neural network calculations. Um, uh, so, but then there's folks like the NVIDIA um, Corp who has uh, you know, these GPUs that pretty much rather everyone's using and they have this optimized runtime, it's called TensorRT, that's been kind of dormant the last couple of years uh, because it's been in the obscure you know, sort of research cafe, piano kind of world. Um, but they finally now support TensorFlow. 
And what they do is they take your neural network that's you know five, ten layers deep, and they can actually you know, fuse things together. They can um, because they know their GPU hardware so well, right? Like they could actually um, you know sort of rewrite your shitty code, right? So similar to like a logical query plan down to a physical query plan um, in the you know traditional boring uh, uh, database sense. Um, so we're starting to see these things, and they're so far away from the data scientist's ability to, you know, just turn this on with, like, you know, just, yeah. So think of, like, a drop down or, you know, like a flow um, uh, similar to SageMaker where you could say, I want to select um, a different runtime. And it's the exact same TensorFlow model. It's just going to go through some uh, more optimization. So, you know, sometimes they'll work and sometimes they won't. But one thing I learned at Netflix is that, right, like, you never know what's going to work and what's not going to work. You just have to test it, and uh, it's it's not good enough to just test offline. Right? You, yeah, you have to test these things offline. Um, and you know, there's like millions of predictions happening per second. There's you know hundreds of trading jobs maybe at best uh, per day. If you can make small optimizations, you know, uh, at that scale, uh, yeah, this is huge. So I'll speed this up a little bit. Um, one thing that we do, so these Docker images, I keep uh, like coming back to that, that work within SageMaker. Uh, yeah, so you can do this from the command line, right? So you can actually uh, like pull down the open source CLI pipeline. It's all open source stuff, by the way, which is another reason why funding isn't you know, being thrown our way. Um, so you would actually pull that, like you point to the model. So that, you know, there's your, your TensorFlow model. Um, What's unique about this is that you're you're treating the model as part of an of a sort of overall runtime, right? So, gone are the days of just training the model, versioning that thing, and then you know taking it from one server, putting it onto another server, and keeping your fingers crossed that it's the same version of Scikit-Learn or the same version of um, XGBoost or whatnot. You're actually hydrating or um, are the creating uh, this like executable from the model. And so this is an executable in the form of um, right, like either a like web service, like a REST service, or think of it like a Kafka stream, right? So I can deploy this thing, tell it the coordinates for my Kafka topic, and now I've got batch, you know, rather real time, sort not batch, but I have like real time stream predictions happening, and it's it's the exact same process that I showed with the stage. Um, and so this actually came out of uh, one early use case that we heard, which was. Uh, that fear of, of taking this model and not knowing where it was going to be deployed, right? There's this classic hand it over the wall kind of thing these data scientists train and they hand it over the wall, uh, whatever that means, um, and it gets re-implemented in C or Java or, uh, God forbid, Spark ML, something like that, right? So, um, yeah, so this way, what you actually move through your, your Right, like different environments from local to dev to test to staging to yeah, whatever the fuck out to production. It's the exact same Docker image. Um, and so now what you can do is you can actually uh, do load tests locally. So yes, I might show this here in a bit, but I'm sure you can just kind of imagine. So I'm still on my machine and I've created that Docker image, right? Just because I want to make sure I have the exact runtime. I can try out different runtimes too. I can try TensorFlow, I can try um, right, like different things. Um, or right, like it's not just runtimes, but it's like runtime configurations. So think of at like prediction time, you can actually batch up predictions. You can wait 10 milliseconds and grab all the predictions that you can make one big matrix multiply, take it back, and then split it back out to all the people that are following you. Um, so there's you know, things like that that like data scientists don't even know that they can do to speed up the inference. And right, like one thing I'm starting to see too, like, um, yeah, so talking to more and more AI groups uh, at these AI first companies, there's that term AI first, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's like trained to serve, right? Which sounds kind of silly, it, it, you know, sounds like an army slogan or something like that, but we're like training these models to right, like, do something with these things, to actually predict with them, not to just stay in the lab, right? Like a grad student that just you know, wants to stay in the lab. Yeah, these things are actually going, I'm like totally offending everyone in this room, which is awesome. All right, so, um, but like the ability to actually start that Docker container locally and do a mini load test, right? So you could actually pass in and say, 
Um, that same command that I was using to call SageMaker and to call my Kubernetes, I can just point at mobile. And I can get a relative sense, while this is not production hardware, I can get a relative sense. It's, it is the exact same uh, like laptop, right? Yes, maybe there's something, you know, I'm streaming Netflix in the background, I might slow it down or whatever. But if you're running on the exact same machine, I can get a kind of a rough idea of did the changes that I made and I, I burned into this Docker image, did they make any, uh, you know, strong, um, or like, did it make uh, this input slow down by? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so here it's like 24 milliseconds, 90th, uh, uh, 90th percentile. If I make a change and go from five layers to like 100 layers, and I just do a quick load test locally, that, that by the inference time, is going to shoot way up and it's going to be 100 milliseconds. And so, like, that's kind of an early clue, even before going through all these different environments, right? Like, before getting it out into the test environment, staging, that maybe this isn't the right direction. I should So you push it to your Docker uh, registry. If you want to push it out to Amazon ECR, you can do that or your own private repo. Um, oh, yeah, this slide's kind of out of order here, but yeah. So these are some of the you know cloud-based options, um, Azure ML. Let's see. Yeah, and so back to this idea of the model plus the runtime. So now you can tune these things separately and actually create different variants out of these combinations. So I've already mentioned, you know. Uh, the traditional hyperparameters, um, but like you can also play with your precision, right? So these neural networks are fuzzy, no one really understands you know, like how they work. Yeah, so why not drop it down from full floating point 0.32 down to floating point 0.16? At the NIPS conference last week, um, yeah, Microsoft, uh, yes, they were talking about, um, it was like floating point 0.8 or floating point 0.7, something like that, where they're actually dropping that precision down even below uh, floating point 0.16. And so what this lets you do, so these GPU cores are, you know, 32-bit cores. And if you have floating point 16, let's say, right, like you can actually fit two floating point 16s onto a single, uh, like, floating point 32 GPU core. And so now you can get through and train your data set twice as fast. And so why this is good is when you're first learning your data, you're first, you know, trying to figure out your model and some of your hyperparameters, just the, the traditional ones right now, um, you can actually... Uh, try out right, like different things, train it twice as fast, and then once you start to gain the, that like intuition, then you can back up into the floating point 32 and then let it run for you know, two weeks. Um, so some people actually choose to keep it at floating point 16, and this is because um, on the forward propagation, so separate from all the you know, partial derivatives and all that stuff going back for the training, if we just do the forward prop, right, like multiplying two floating point 16s is way faster than multiplying two floating point 32s. Um, and especially with this pipeline effect that we can put two into each GPU core. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, uh, at that NIPS conference last week, there were two big themes that I heard, which is dropping precision, right, like down to those, you know, these like Microsoft FP7s. And, and secondly, um, changing your batch size, right? So we're doing stochastic mini batch gradient descent, right, typically with these neural networks. And that like mini batch, right, like that's a hyperparameter. It's like, yeah, so how many images should I pull in and, and you know, train on at once? Um, there was a lot of the uh, 8K, so 8192 or whatever seemed to be like a sweet spot. Um, but yeah, beyond that, um, yes, yeah, so training suffered and was like less than that. Um, yeah, it wasn't optimal either. There's, and so people that, that do choose to stay at floating point 32 because they really want this accuracy, right? Like the more bits that you use to uh, store the variables that you're learning, the weights that you're learning, um, right? Like the more accurate your final model is going to be. That's just kind of um, rather the given. Uh, so there's people that still train at, at the full floating point 32, but when they go to like prepare that model for uh, these predictions for the inference side, yes, yeah, so they actually quantize down to 8-bit or to 16-bit. You can actually drop the precision after the model's been trained. And that's just as easy as just looking at all the weights that you've learned and plot them, squeeze them in, right, like linearly quantize them um, down into a smaller set. And that, that has the effect of both speeding up the forward prop, the you know, matrix multiplies, and it makes the model smaller. And so, you know, when you have millions of parameters, uh, if you can shave off half of, um, 
you know, like the weights of these um, friendly variables that you're learning half of the, the size. This could be the difference between really being able to deploy on a small device and not being able to deploy. Right? Five minutes, okay. Uh, yeah, so you can do things like using neural networks together, um, change the batch size, change the runtime. Uh, yeah, so funny enough, when you train, so that's linear regression that we're training um, with uh, like TensorFlow. So that's what linear regression looks like after it's been trained. And there's, uh, I think there's about 92 nodes. And the reason that there's so many nodes is, uh, yes, these neural networks are like always ready to, to be trained. They want more data. And um, if you, so that's not something that you would want to deploy on the forward population, right? On the, so there's ways, there's post-processing ways, and these like techniques are starting to make their way into the sort of mainstream TensorFlow. Like when you prepare a model, there's now a special uh, format called Save Model Format that um, is meant for serving. Um, and but yeah, this is where you can do. There's like something called the Graph Transform tool that you can hook into and uh, do all the that like that like precision reduction and all kind of stuff. Uh, so here's something else too. So like imagine if you need to load up the entire TensorFlow runtime to actually make a prediction, that's about 50 meg, right? This runtime with all of its you know, C++ libraries and everything. So like imagine on a phone, that's not a problem, right? We have tons of RAM. Um, but on these tiny sensors and right, like things like this, we can't afford 50 meg just for the runtime, just in case we call a you know, particular function. And so what we can do is, um, there's like this technique, it's actually on the slide before, it's called TF Compile. There's kind of the second generation that's now meant um, specifically for mobile uh, that's called TensorFlow Lite. So this is um, like a post-processing technique where you give it your neural network, you pass, you, um, you know, show like TF Compile, for example, um, that would be some binary that you run. You would give it uh, your graph, you would show it your weights, and so TensorFlow can actually start at where the input would go, right? Like it, where that like image would go. It'll then traverse just the bare minimum and just pull in from TensorFlow and from the operating system, just the .so files, the, the C libraries that are needed. And so the, the actual output um, of this like TensorLite process is something that you would link into your C++ code that's 50K versus you know, 50 meg. Uh, so, yeah, and there's, um, there's not yet actually GPU support for TF Compile, uh, but you can bet there's, there's going to be TPU support because that's a, um, you know, Google thing. Yeah, so TensorRT is another runtime. Uh, yeah, the ability to do, so this is something obviously from like Netflix, these you know, canary deploys. Uh, we like the shadow canary because it's the safest way to push out models, uh, they're sort of asynchronously getting the same thing that the main model is getting. Um, but if they die for whatever reason, it's not going to affect the actual request response or the Kafka stream. Um, most of the time when people talk about canaries, they're speaking about split canaries because shadow canaries are, um, there's more infrastructure, right? Like we're actually using Kafka, uh, the main model, um, the second and third models subscribe to the first model, and then those same inputs go to the second and third We'll predict it and then we can chart it, but it's not going to affect the edge. But in most cases, people talk about split canaries, and that's where you're actually literally splitting the traffic. Um, and so that's where Istio comes in. I don't think I'm going to have a chance to get to the Istio slides, but um, I'll post them, of course. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of the money dashboard here. Um, this is, I think, we did this and then one other demo for uh, the startup challenge, and I think this is what. Um, that like really put us front in front here. So this is combining both offline metrics, so we can see how do the model do offline, which is typically where data scientists end. That's all the visibility that they have. And you know something at Netflix, my first day when I was given access to production, and I couldn't believe it, and uh, about two months later, I actually took production down um, by pushing out a configuration that I thought was in seconds, and it was in milliseconds. And so all North American devices is pounded. Uh, the, um, yeah, it, yeah, so it was a bad thing. Yeah, anyway, um, I still survived though. Yeah, I did not get fired. So here um, 
if you can give data scientists access to more data, right? I mean, these people like data, right? Yeah, so we all like data. Uh, the more fresh our data is, the more real time it is, the better. Uh, so by stopping at the offline metrics and not giving them visibility into how these models are doing after they've been pushed, and um, better yet, sitting alongside the current model. Um, yes, I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, that like middle box is the predictive like comparison. So for the same inputs, um, how are B and C scoring? And here we see C is actually predicting very similar. It's tracking very similar to A. The goal for this experiment was to find something similar to A that wouldn't rock the boat on the prediction side, on the actual value that's, that comes out of the prediction, uh, but it's faster. And so I believe this experiment, they were comparing, uh, yes, I can't remember, it, it, yeah, it was something with uh, TensorFlow. Um, so here C is tracking pretty well, so that's good. And then also C ends up coming in about 10 milliseconds faster per prediction. And we actually threw in one extra metric um, here, which is cost per prediction. Right? Yeah, so like imagine um, in the morning, you have all these spot instances from Amazon, and your cost per prediction is super low, because these things are 40% you know, the cost of a regular instance. But then throughout the day, as everyone in you know, California wakes up, we all go to work, and then we start spitting up our like, Amazon instances, and now, all these, the spot market tips over and, and now we're paying full price um, for these Amazon instances. If we can get a cheaper instance somewhere else, and the uh, like demo that we did was with Google, um, we could actually slowly shift traffic over to Google and then still have some instances of the models running on um, like Amazon at the full price, uh, but yeah, we can actually trigger off those cost of production. So, one thing I realized going through the fundraising stuff a little bit is that right now, anyway, uh, current state of the Bay Area is that no one gives a shit about cost saving. So, so I don't. Uh, but I think it's cool. I'm a pretty frugal guy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm wearing my competitor's uh, sweater here. Or yes, what the hoodie? That's how frugal I got it for free last week. Um, okay, that's it. Yeah. So A/B tests. Uh, if you're doing A-B tests, you're basically, you know, like five years behind the times. Uh, you should be doing multi-arm bandits. Um, they're adaptive, they're exciting. Um, they're not inflexible and boring. Um, yeah, so this is just showing us shifting traffic, uh, trying to maximize revenue, minimize cost. And let's see, holy grail here is continuous model training, which we're gonna call it soon. Uh, yeah, this is the last thing. Um, so here's a case, because we're tapping into this request or this prediction stream, right, like imagine, and yes, we actually implemented this um, at one big customer, is like the ability to trap the inputs and because, so if I back up, well, yeah, this is the famous hot dog, not hot dog. So with each prediction, right, like we're actually getting confidence values. So we're being told it's 49% confident that it's a hot dog and 51 that it's, you know, so in like real time, that user is still getting that prediction back, but within a certain tolerance for these unconfident predictions, these kind of 50-50 cases, or if there's 10 classes, you know, it would be 10%, 10, 10, 10, 10. Um, we can actually channel uh, those inputs off to a separate uh, Kafka topic is what we're doing. And right, like trap those for relabeling or for kind of like human intervention, right? And um, what's cool about that is that you're targeting, right, like data that's sort of on those prediction like, boundaries, those like, classification boundaries, and you now have a human come in and they can override the prediction, right, and kind of build confidence right at those edges. And so we're taking previously unlabeled data and we're converting it to trained, or, or, or like, labeled training data. Um, we went, or this particular customer went like to the extent where they, um, had this listener that was pulling off the Kafka topic and posting it to Slack and then doing kind of an internal crowdsource. Um, you know, there's all kinds of crazy shit you can do with Slack and like the events API and all that. So um, that, that lasted about a day and then people, you know, got kind of bored with that. Uh, and then very quickly they're like, well, wait, yeah, we can bring in Crowdflower or you know, Mechanics or something like that and open up the Slack channel to them and they could do this for us. Um, this particular use case, it was a, a fraud kind of case where 
Uh, it's a company similar to Airbnb that people upload user-generated um, right, like images and people were like uploading phone numbers and ways to go off of this particular service. Um, there was one final thing that we, we still haven't solved that we're still thinking through with this, just to take it one step further, which is like the ability to sort of gamify it, but like more so than just like a leaderboard of like how many that you did, um, right? But actually tie it back to how much better you've made the model based on the like relabeling that you've done. You know, this is kind of a tricky problem um, to sort of quantify, it, but yeah, that would be the, the like ideal state there. So the rest of this is just Istio and how we actually do that. You know, traffic routing and um, how we can trigger off of price per prediction and um, I'll post these as a lot of good references. And, um, I do want to point out this dude here, Christian Posta. If anyone here, well, I'm sure everyone knows this guy. He's like Mr. Kubernetes and Mr. Steel. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. You can do like Chaos Monkey stuff um, with this Theo, where you could actually like inject failures and inject latency and things like that. So I have no idea what happened. Thank you, Chris. Um, we actually went over a little bit, so please grab Chris at the uh, end of the next talk after on the route to um, you know, ask any questions. We'll um, move on to our next speaker, who is a, an ex NVIDIA engineer and uh, currently at Google working on. Uh, the container system and um, as well as Kubernetes. Please welcome Anirudh Ramanathan. Um, I am, if you can click the share screen. I've been working on the Kubernetes team for about a year and a half, but close to two years now. Uh, I've been working on the Kubernetes team for close to two years now. Uh, I started off with a focus more on uh, like stateful applications, stateful sets, the uh, core controllers, stuff like that, and then uh, moved on to uh, batch workloads. And now focus a little bit on machine learning as well. So this talk is going to be more of how the Kubernetes community perceives these new workloads, uh, machine learning, data processing, etc. What investments the open source community is making, and how uh, people can make use of that. Not all of it might be useful like immediately, but uh, in the future, all of these projects are evolving. So it's also about uh, getting more people on board. So So, disclaimer, I'm not a machine learning expert, so please uh, don't put me in the stuff that I say about machine learning. I work on infrastructure, I get paid to write open source software, which is awesome.
So uh, this is kind of capturing the state of Kubernetes. This is probably more. Um, and how many use it for like state pool workloads? Uh, databases, that sort of thing. Okay. Yes, in or in any way, actually. Okay, so that was a sizable number, or well, some number, and I was not sure about a year ago. Most people were just running like serving workloads on the internet and auto scaling that and just having that. Um, and part of the reason was it was really hard to understand how to build applications on it because um, the abstractions were so low level, it needed understanding all of these new concepts just to get started. And uh, that is good for certain classes of uh, users, like DevOps folks who are happy to get it down to the weeds. But if you talk about data scientists, data engineers, the level of abstraction is different, and that wasn't quite available to Kubernetes at that point. Kubernetes today is very different, and uh, the big one, you have seen the whole shift in, in the focus. It's no longer about, hey, how can I uh, you know, retrofit my entire application into these existing mechanisms? It's more about, uh, there are so many extension points that are available. How can I uh, make use of that to run my application as similarly as I do currently within the event? That's kind of a, a, a shift that's happening, and that's made that's enabled by all of the extension points that were introduced. You can extend the API, you can change the container runtime, you can change the storage abstraction, you can change the networking, you can change pretty much anything. Um, and, and one other thing that this enables is you can build more stuff on top of, of the existing uh, frameworks. So you no longer have to worry just about uh, infrastructure, you can have higher level APIs built on top uh, within Kubernetes. So, how did this translate into? Uh, other classes of workloads other than just uh, state, stateless ones. Uh, so first off, what really changed like concretely, uh, the workload controllers, replica set, stateful set, all of that stuff, all of that stuff has moved into GA. So it's a better substrate for building things on top of. Uh, CRDs, uh, custom resource definitions, these are ways that you can extend the Kubernetes API and create controllers that weren't actually created for you in the first place. So how, how many people have used any Kubernetes extension mechanism before? Okay, that's a very easy question. Sure, it's a growing community. Um, so CRDs and aggregated APIs are ways that you can write uh, controllers like replica set and state set and so on on the outside without it being a part of Kubernetes itself. And, and that being uh, Possible enables things like Kubernetes operators, which are uh, which enable people to like add domain-specific knowledge into uh, a controller. For example, uh, an operator might be the etcd operator, or or this one for MongoDB. Uh, what that does is you can specify things like how many shards you want, or or some Mongo abstraction, and have this operator just translate that into uh, deployment or, or set of pods and so on. So the, the level of abstraction is just higher. And uh, one more thing that has changed is community support for some framework. I'll talk about this uh, later. And there's lots of work going on in the scheduling and resource management space, especially with support of batch, how do you do preemption, how do you do the, the queuing, and things like that. Uh, so this, this is my favorite definition of machine learning. Uh, solving problems without explicitly knowing how to create solutions. But this uh, covers a very broad picture. Uh, so this, uh, this is from the TFX paper, uh, which was presented at ADB. So this, this kind of describes the infrastructure that goes into machine learning at Google and in general. Like if one is looking to build an entire pipeline, then this is uh, probably what it looks like. Uh, there's uh, job management where they're trying to submit things. Uh, there's uh, configuration that wants to apply to all of the training and serving and so on. And then of course, there's uh, ingestion of data, you have to clean it, you have to transform it, validate. And then there's the, the obvious ones you train, you store, uh, 
evaluate the model, find and insert it, and of course, there's the and when it's in production, you want to have metrics, you want to know what's happening to my model, how the values are doing. Yeah. So this is a lot of different stages. And um, differentiating in this particular stack, um, differentiating in the job management or any of that for any company or any solution is not really useful. Uh, there is a shared substrate to be found, and this is kind of what we're thinking of. Uh, a lot of this. Uh, this uh, lot of stages of this pipeline can actually easily be built on Kubernetes. And it takes away the pain of setting up this whole thing so that you can realize value sooner. Uh, value in this is from actually processing data or you know, the data scientists getting to work on this, this whole pipeline, but not actually setting up the whole thing. So, uh, this is one thing that we announced at KubeCon. Uh, Kubeflow is this project that uh, sets up this, it, it aims to be the stack density, the stack that is uh, like showed you. So we started really small. We were like, what's the minimum viable thing? What's the things that we know people really want to do? Um, and of course, everyone wants to do interactive things in a notebook. So we went to Jupyter Hub, which gives you like this. Uh, uh, a sort of interface to manage lots and lots of workers for lots and lots of people. Um, we wrote a TensorFlow training controller that can scale to do a single node or a multiple node training and um, can express it as a Kubernetes operator. And uh, a really simple tier serving deployment that lets you take that training model and actually deploy it in production. So, uh, just to emphasize, our goal is to not create this layer of abstraction, this API on top or anything like that, to provide these individual things, these individual components that can then be strung together in the pipeline and in some way realize actual value. So just to drill down into each of the components, Jupyter Hub, uh, it runs entirely with Kubernetes. It's, this, uh, it's enabled by this project that lets you spawn Jupyter nodes in Kubernetes and also like request things like I want to attach GPUs to my Kubernetes uh, notebook. You can do that. Uh, request resources, um, shape your notebook however you want. And once you have your notebook, you might uh, you know, do a single node training. Um, but eventually, you want this reproducible entity, and you want to fit it into a pipeline. At that point, you might use this uh, TensorFlow operator, which has its own API, and you can supply what you want. For a job to actually do uh, in terms of the parameter servers, um, workers, master, etc., and it will take care of the actual training and the, the logs aggregation, all of that is uh, for you. Again, it uses the Kubernetes abstractions energy, it's using job and it's thinking of pods, it's not doing anything special or that. Serving, again, it's, it's a pretty simple deployment. We do think there's a lot of work here to be done, and some of it will come from the TensorFlow side, some of it will come from Kubernetes. Um, for example, we want to use uh, maybe custom metrics to scale up and down the serving deployment, but then we go back to the TensorFlow team and we realize, oh, we don't have a way to pump that through. So that adding those metrics falls on the TensorFlow side, and then we will try and consume that and uh, provide more contributions to the other screen. But uh, one might ask, there were so many stages, right? There was the data cleaning, there was the transformation, we didn't talk about any of that. So, um, there's even a pipeline and we didn't talk about that. Um, how do we do all of those other stages? So we just have ideas for now, and this is all investments that the Kubernetes community has made over the past year. And uh, it could be used to build this pipeline. Again, we're not opinionated, it's about you know, providing the components and letting people build their own pipeline. So one of those components is uh, Spark. Spark is a good thing for certain use cases. Maybe uh, you know, so some parts of the data pipeline possibly. Uh, we've been working on Spark since uh, December of last year. Uh, it's currently being upstream into Spark 2.3. We will see a release probably, they actually uh, delay the release for us. Because we work in the code from state. Um, so we're probably going to see a release in uh, January. Um, 
the thing that it does is Spark itself at this point would be aware of Kubernetes. So you could just download your Spark distribution, point it at any Kubernetes cluster, and it just work. It will spin up uh, a Spark application like uh, a set of executors, a driver, all of that. And all of that would run within Kubernetes, uh, aggregate logs, do all of the things that a Spark application needs to do and spin that up. The, it, it enables more kind of things, but um, it is it's like two minutes auto scaling, maybe in the future. Um, dynamic resource allocation that's not in yet, probably Spark 2.4, but that could give you the ability to say, uh, as parts of that, spin up and down in the number of pods, depending on some dynamic so cycle or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but we currently have a uh, Spark integration with Kubernetes that's in the so Spark 2.3, we're going to do Java and Scala, PySpark and uh, Spark R coming in 2.4, mostly. Uh, it's only static allocation for now. You can do like a lot of and it has some uh, dependency management built in, but we have a lot of other plans as well. And there are tons of organizations actually running this in production. Uh, they see good results of it. But one of the things that we gain from something like Spark, running Spark alongside your serving job, serving workloads, is uh, the efficiencies that come from one, I have just one cluster abstraction to manage. It's not a separate stack for yarn, and it's a separate thing for things. And it's, it's just, uh, it's also like utilization wise, it's a better thing. Although like, most people just care about the fact that we have one set of apps to be managing. One other investment that the community has been making is uh, in Apache Airflow. So Airflow, if, uh, how many people here are familiar with Airflow? Okay. Uh, so Airflow is this DAX scheduler that lets you express steps of a pipeline or a set of jobs in, in Python. So it's kind of opinionated and uh, Some people might prefer using a VSL for this sort of thing, but um, it is one way to do it. It's pretty effective. It uh, has a good community behind it, and they've been really receptive to Kubernetes support. So, uh, one of the things we've been working on is a Kubernetes executor that works within Airflow so that uh, Airflow can entirely run in Kubernetes. So, all of the jobs you launch, all of the stages of your pipeline are actually done in Kubernetes pods. We have mechanisms that can inject secrets, credentials, all of that stuff to make that uh, easy to use. Uh, so, if, this is an example. If, if you guys haven't seen Airflow, this is what uh, it, it comes with these things called operators that can let you talk to other applications. So, there might be a Spark operator that says, Here's supply these five different uh, options, and you can do something with Spark. Uh, with that, it might be you know, you're running a certain batch command. The stuff that we are adding is more like you know, executor config, where we want to be able to shape that part that's been launched, uh, to find how much memory and CPU you can use, what Docker image can use for that. So, uh, so when it comes to like a new uh, pipeline that you see some people already starting to build, this is a set of components that uh, we're starting with. These are methods. Uh, of course, when, when I mentioned Spark, uh, it's Worth mentioning that there's a lot of related efforts as well. Like uh, Spark with HDFS, Spark with Kerberos, all of that. Uh, we're looking at running all of that well. Um, so, yeah, uh, Qflow uh, it's, it's a product that's aimed at not just being TensorFlow. And in fact, we're more, we're asking for community participation to kind of figure out what other frameworks might fit there and how we build out this entire idea. If you're looking to get involved in any of the stuff, there's uh, a few flows, Slack channel, there's Twitter, all of the stuff. If you want to talk about anything from the big data side, Spark, Airflow, just gives us there's our weekly meeting, which we run. Thank you, Andrew. Take questions now, and we can take questions for both Chris and Andrew. So, um, if you raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. 
Anyone has any questions? For a second, I don't know if you're going to share the slide you had. Uh, you kind of speak to the slide. Yeah. Part, and you mentioned something about the like, 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 Oh, um, yeah. I mean, being silly, of course, but um, yeah, like multi arm bandit. So the like, big difference between AB tests and a multi arm bandit tests are when you get stuck in a test cell or like a bad test cell, this actually just happened in the like, Uber. Where I got placed into a bad test cell with Uber, and they thought that I would, um, but they literally didn't show Uber apps. Like I, I would be standing next to my friend who could get some Uber apps, and I couldn't get some. Um, and they were trying to make me do the premium. And, uh, and so this went on for about like, two weeks or something. And so I just stopped using it because I started using Flywheel and um, uh, Lyft and all that. I was trying to find that sidecar. Go to sidecar. Um, it's gone. Yeah, you know that. Um, the big difference is when you're in an AP test, like statistically, that test has to run for the full duration, for the full, full two weeks. And so this is screwing me, you know, or I think that um, very clearly this isn't working. And so with these multi arm bandits, that's the, you know, like it's for and sport kind of thing. Um, but, so, like statistically, if, if you find an early winner, what you do is you start pounding that. You start shifting traffic to that, that like version one. And the goal is to either prove or disprove right away. But right? it's like uh, when you meet someone on Tinder and you really like them, you get calls them all the time, and then you know, it's like, oh, it doesn't work. Well, that's why I'm not going to have this. You're trying to like, figure out if you like what you did. Yeah, that strategy doesn't work on the stick to the test track. Um, so, uh, and then if, if it is the clear winner, you still have to let it run until you've trained that, that multi-arm bandit experiments uh, you know, down below a certain threshold. There's no value left in this experiment anymore. Whereas with these AP tests, they, they have to run. It's just, it's, it's the ability to be more dynamic. And the way that you can do it, for example, uh, with the pipeline stuff or with SafeMaker, uh, you, you know, have some, some like long running uh, like process that's out there that's you know like continuously. So the way uh, you know, so like throughout the day, you can sampling and you can see is um, you know, this variance the clear winner, and you you are like dynamically calling into SafeMaker's APIs to shift the traffic, or you can get, you know call these other pipeline APIs and, and like dynamically shift the traffic over. Um, and then once you've drained that experiment of its value, then you just tear it. And then you can move on to the tests. Like there's still the classic problem of having many tests running that are affecting each other and you know, split lanes and all that. That's not solved. What's your experience with it with mosquito been like? I mean, how would you rate maturity kind of production readiness mostly? Yeah. Yeah, so those were all the slides that uh, I was supposed to put the slides back together. Um, yeah, so what's cool about Istio and um, people like, like Christian Postdocs from Red Hat is that they've, they've taken all of the early Netflix stuff, like there's this project called Zool that was part of the Netflix open source that um, is how we would surgically, you know, point traffic and you know, do so for like Netflix, like use case specifically, Zool came out of a debugging type of thing. Like we had one, uh, fire storm, fire storm, fire thing where, um, like some big director at Netflix was complaining that his recommendations were completely off and that you know, they were totally bogus. And we needed a way to just, you know, isolate his traffic from his exploits. Um, and we literally couldn't do this. We would have to run high queries, you know, that were combined because these were shared, you know, streaming services. And, um, and personalization service. So for, for us to pinpoint his specific customer ID, you would, you know, it would be a high period that would take four hours. Um, and you know, so what we what came out of this was the ability to route traffic. So it was kind of we found load balancers, um, or it was, it was basically a load balancer, right? Like that. And um, 
And my Pepsi Bear case, it ended up being his partner who had logged into the Xbox and she was with his like accounts. And, and so I just kind of side note. Um, but uh, yeah, he was freaking out thinking that our code was bad, but really uh, the person living in his home had changed. This is back before multiple profiles and all that. Um, but yeah, the ability to, um, so it's all the same patterns that uh, came out of Zool and came out of like the uh, the service discovery and it's built on top of Envoy. So really, I mean, um, it's kind of studying um, deeper into the stack or uh, science and depth. Um, I've really come to realize how much like Envoy really is doing in this. Um, you know, at, at first I thought maybe Envoy was just kind of replacing the service discovery, but it's really doing a lot of stuff. And as Istio's, right, like not to kind of diminish its value, but um, it's kind of a bridge, you know, between like Kubernetes and then you know, making it. So yeah, Envoy ends up becoming a sidecar, which is not a Netflix, but the pattern that we use at Netflix. Um, to bring that sidecar and you know, sits alongside your uh, microservices and you can do all that. So, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been pretty good. Um, we use it, yeah, obviously, for the AD testing, um, or for the abandoned um, traffic routing. We use it uh, for you know, chaos monkey type of things, right? Um, there's a, a few limitations. When you start scripting things inside of YAML, like, that's when I get kind of you know, nervous when because there's you know so many cool things you can do where you can target specific customer IDs and inspect headers and, and you start looking at this demo and it's starting to become this if statements and ors and ends and you know, basically building a new language here and something. Are you using pilot and mixer? Yeah. Have you seen any like latency problems with mixer or anything like that? Uh, yeah. Uh I mean so I just upgraded to pre O for for this. Um, haven't, not, yeah, not that I'm, yeah, have you been using it? Yeah, we haven't started using it yet. Yeah. Yeah. The like mixer stuff, I didn't actually fully understand it like until preparing like where it actually fit in. So um, also, oh yeah, something else that we turned on was uh, the uh, what was it called Zipkin, yeah, the Zipkin stuff. Um, like you don't really realize how powerful that that like so I was just talking to some Twitter folks and it's one of those projects that so many people have left Twitter that contributed to it that's kind of moving within Twitter. Um, yes, I find it pretty valuable. I mean, there's not until you actually see it getting used to you know, like oh this is really what you have for the individual requests, right? So, um, but yeah, yeah, because there's ways to use this to feel like about. Anyone else? Question? I have a question. Which I was going to ask you tomorrow morning. Um, so, the route that you guys are you encouraging Kubeflow contributors, people to come in to, to build CRDs? Like, is that, and like, what, you know, right? Like, why did you guys choose the TensorFlow jobs here or to make that a CRD? Okay. Uh, so for TensorFlow in specific, for the civil training, we had to do a CRD because it was very difficult to get that same pattern out of any of the existing controller instructions. But that isn't to say that everything needs to be a CRD. That's not strictly necessary. If something can be a deployment, and you can see the TF serving thing right now is a deployment. And it's perfectly fine that way. It's just about finding the right abstraction for the right use case. So, uh, yeah. so uh, uh, another example would be like Jupyter Hub, right? So Jupyter Hub right now is this operator for Jupyter Notebooks. It's, it's this interface that lets you manage tons of Jupyter Notebooks. In some sense, that behaves like a Kubernetes operator, but you don't need a CRD for it. It's uh, written in Python. It's making calls to the Kubernetes API through, through Python. Yeah, in that case, you would need a CRD. So for the CRDs, right, like you get the garbage collection and all this kind of stuff, right? But for the TF job stuff, because I've gone about it the other way where I've, I'm just using Jinja and I'm just creating the YAML and all that just because it, it, it's crockable to me and I don't understand Kubernetes as well as you do. 
for those um, third party resource and the, the, the customer resource stuff. But like to me, like going into the internals of uh, this particular this project seems kind of uh, like counterintuitive, you know, especially for something. Although, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out the like cutoff point, like where does it make sense to like integrate within and then kind of move out? I think we're all. I'm, I'm also. Uh, I'm also bothered by the idea of taking this to the last day of Um and I think we're all kind of trying to figure that out at this point. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for the community to make, uh, you know, make their voice known. Um, there are some proposals out there that uh, are actively seeking commentary. Yeah, how fast did you guys hit a thousand stars? <laughs> it was almost over that day. The other day, I found out about it two days before the talk, and there were like 29 stars, and then it was like 1200 a day. Yeah. It was on Hacker News, right? It was, it was on Hacker News. It was trending on GitHub at one point. Really? Yeah, it is. I mean, it just goes to show that there are lots of people trying to tackle these yeah. exact same problems and not really. Of getting any value of doing it differently, so it makes sense to have those comments. It's kind of what Kubernetes did for uh, infrastructure management. Beyond that, uh, beyond that, I think it's a really great use. Beyond that, I think this is a really great use case for Kubernetes. It really kind of speaks to what it does in terms of like scaling up and scaling down and uh, making the best use of the resources. So. I'm particularly excited about the way it would fit in with the, the other investments that we made to make that entire pipeline possible. That, that is super interesting. Are you guys looking at things beyond machine learning applications for more stable traditional server type uh, solutions and doing some orchestration with that? Can you give me an example of uh, what else is like? Help stack or something like that. So there's some work on using like this is an, another part of the team that uh, is not related to Kubo. Uh, there's some work on like operators for things like Kafka, um, like standardizing on what we call a good operator, a well-written one, which exposes all the right flags and lets you configure your Kafka cluster in a certain way. So I've heard about that for Redis and Kafka. The other workloads and more of the complex stacks that I I haven't heard of any uh, like open source ones, but uh, I'm sure the community will come to our. Question. Uh, you guys were talking about using both CPUs and GPUs and both sort of uh, combine them. Um, just from your experience, how have you guys decided to do your usage like and how when to use CPUs, when to use GPUs, and how they can complement each other? Are there specific use cases where, for example, Netflix or you guys would rely on a CPU or they can complement the CPUs? To, uh, more yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, the right, like the one thing um, that they can go through right, pretty much every customer that, that we start talking to, they want to try the GPUs, they just assume that they're going to be faster, right? And on the serving side in particular, unless you can handle larger batches, like your Right, like you can batch up 50 milliseconds worth of requests and then pass it to the GPU. That was just one, one like many copy versus a bunch of small many copies. Um, right, really CPUs seem to be fine. Um, the other, uh, on the train side, you know, like there was a point in time when like I just was always going to throw GPUs at everything and I was going to always throw TensorFlow at everything. You start working with more and more teams, and like one of the, the like cool things about something like pipelines is that you can 
like creates like multiple experiments with you and try these things out. And one of the things that popped out of that was they actually found that uh, a piano model was actually faster, you know, so, um, but I guess are complex models. This is, you know, like uh, 500 like log lines coming in and, you know, like, um, right, like recurrent neural nets and, and uh, when they deployed the TensorFlow version, it was just choking, and then when they deployed you know, piano, and so this is some, like, yeah, this is a, a configuration that we never even thought would be, um, and this was with GPUs as well, too. So, it, right, like my point is that what you need is a good experimentation framework to just try these things out. Right? Everyone's workload's different. Uh, offline is going to be different than online. But, um, there's things that, that uh, um, right, depending on batch sizes and things like that, you just have to have an opportunity. To is your question specifically about like, GPU versus CPU? Yeah, so we started experimenting with this and we tried, started with like, CPUs, and then like you said, we wanted to start with CPUs. Yeah. It turns out that we didn't really have the CPU. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. What kind of payload do you guys have coming in? Like, how big is the. Uh, so we're starting with pretty simple uh, models, uh, just like simple regression models. Yeah. Relatively small data sets, which is perhaps why you don't have the right right on the CPU. Oh, and yeah, this is on training or this is on mostly on training. On the training side, yeah. Um, also, too, with like the new Volta V100, for example, that it just came out by NVIDIA this year, um, has these tensor cores on them, which are very similar to the TPU, um, which means that they can do uh, A times B plus C. Super fast, and while while at first thought this is good on the, just the prediction side, just the forward prop, right? Like keep in mind that uh, your training process is a forward prop and a back prop, right? So the faster you can do the forward, obviously you can start doing the back as well too. So, um, yeah, one one problem that we see CPU or GPU, but this shows up more with GPUs is uh, the actual pipeline, but like getting data in. So yeah, are you guys using TensorFlow? Yeah, so are you using like new data set, the new data set API? Or, uh, no. Yeah, you're using queues though, right? Like, the whole, like, if, like you're using feedict, that's the absolute slowest way to do it. The feedict um, is in all the examples in the demos because it's very notebookable. You know, you put it in a notebook and it runs. Um, what I'm getting at is that the most common thing that we see is with training side slowdowns, or, or um, why people complain so much, uh, is that GPU utilization, right? Like, have you guys uh, kept an eye on the GPU utilization? Do you see that it's only being used 5% or 10% or something like that? No, we haven't. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the super easy way to do it is to just run the NVIDIA-SMI um, in, in a separate window and just do you know, watch. Uh, and do it every half second or something, and you'll see it pump up and down. Um, that's kind of a quick way. People do that just to make sure that the GPU is even being used, because like a lot of times you see on Stack Overflow, um, people are like, there's no way the GPU is being used. I'm like, this is too slow. And what's typically happening, either they're not monitoring it somehow, um, or they're using wrong version of TensorFlow that is using the uh, GPU. But in most cases, it, they're just not utilizing it. They're not pushing the data to the GPU fast enough. And the Q framework was kind of an interim. Uh, Qs within the uh, TensorFlow API are a way to pull data in parallel and prepare it to go to the GPU. But now there's the data set API, which is even lower level, which is C, which is, um, you know, kind of hiding a lot of the complexity of those queues where the data scientists had to think about, um, you know, threads and like, thread pools and all that stuff. So with the data set API, you can just, um, uh, yeah, just point out the data. Also, something I noticed with Google Cloud is they've actually, Optimize the data set API if you're using GCS or S3 or uh, Google. Um, 
there is like they're doing these tricks to pull in parallel, you know. So similar to when you're accessing S3 and it's pulling that something as it goes pulling it down, it's, it's chopped it up and pulling it in parallel. Um, but yeah, just keep an eye on the, the, the saturation point. So we might have Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. There's one guy, his name is Derek Murray, um, who I've been trying to get on speech at. You know? um, yeah, these Google guys are a little shifty. You know, they're, they're, like, they don't have a lot of uh, connections on LinkedIn. You know, they've been there for like 10 years, and uh, they don't really know the open source community very well. Just continue to do it. Um, but yeah, I was talking to one guy about a POC that worked at Google, and he never heard of POC. And, what do you call? Like, do you call for the um, so, uh, this guy, Derek Murray, it's M R R Y. This is GitHub and Stack Overflow. So, one trick I do, I actually stalk people on Stack Overflow. You can drill into their user, and then there's a tab for activities, totally unintuitive. And, and the bottom is a link to their RSS feed. And people that I see over and over on Stack Overflow answering questions, like when I'm Googling, um, and they you know, continue to show up. These are people that I uh, set up. I have blocked or whatever uh, running each morning in the summary of the stuff, like the questions that they answer. And there are like, usually things that I haven't hit yet that I'm glad that they answered because someone else you know, found about them. Um, he's the guy, that, uh, Derek Murray guy, uh, is the main idea of the thing. It's funny because this is where you see TensorFlow becoming more like Spark. They're trying to become more like Spark, um, and at the same time, Dataverse is trying to add more uh, uh, to Spark. Anything else? Well, um, thank you everyone for coming to the meetup. I know. Yeah, that um the TFX stuff is really interesting. Yeah, kind of get